Hey guys, so yesterday we were talking about the different types of, uh, you know, biotic things in the environment and how they can be an herbivore, a carnivore, an, auto, uh, an omnivore, and we talked about autotrophs being plants. These, uh, these guys make their own food. So auto meaning self and troph mean feeding. So they're self-feeders. They get their food from the sun and they make their own sugar. We, on the other hand, like most animals and other fungi, are heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are other feeders. They eat other things. They eat food is basically it. Um, that other thing might be a plant. That other thing might be another animal. Uh, it might be both, and that's why they're considered herbivores if they eat plants or carnivores if they eat just other animals or omnivores if they eat both of those things. So today I wanted to put those together before we talk a little bit about um, some of the other things in your notes like invasive species. Um, so let's talk about how they go together and let's look at your jam board in order to do that. And if you want to pull it up, you can, but I'm working in the one that we have together. Um, some people put stuff on this slide. I don't really know why. I just deleted it. Um, if you put yours on this slide in the different groups, it's awesome. I see that it stayed for the most part color coded, which is really kind of cool. It looks good. Um, I did delete a number of things if they were repeats or just incorrect, or if you could not see them outside, like someone wrote in their elephant, those are not outside. I asked you to go outside and look at things and maybe what you would find in your area and the elephant is not going to be there. Um, so if they were kind of out there and far fetched, I got rid of them. If there's a possibility that they could be there, then I went ahead and um, kept them in here. Okay. And then the last um, kind of page on this jam board is just whether or not things are living or non-living. I moved these two over to the abiotic section. Someone had put them in biotic. Remember biotic means alive and the air temperature or water temperature is not a living thing and neither is the sun. The sun is up in the, you know, in the universe is in the center of our solar system. The sun is not made of cells. The sun does not reproduce. The sun does not have DNA in it. It's not a living thing. So it goes in the abiotic factor and we do definitely want that. That's a super important one to have. We have sunlight here already. Um, either one of them can work. But um, actually what I'm going to do is put together what we call an energy chain or a food um, chain with some of these things that you guys have. And I'm going to start with making a new frame and I'll leave this up here. And let's start with the sun because this is where most of all of our energy chains start. Um, there are a few exceptions on the planet, but the sun definitely is where um, we get most of our energy from here on the planet. And usually the energy that's located within the sun goes to another individual. And that individual will be some sort of autotroph. And so you'd have to remember what the autotrophs are. Autotrophs are producers. So one of these things here, okay? Uh, I'm just gonna use grass if that's okay. And we'll make that uh, the second one in our chain um, besides the sun, right? So this is our first biotic living thing would be grass, okay, as our producer. This thing is capturing the sunlight's energy and making its own food. It's called sugar. So then the energy in the grass goes to another individual, and um, that individual is probably either going to be an omnivore or an herbivore, okay, either one. Um, in my case, I want to make a fairly long chain, so I'm going to look for some sort of herbivore that maybe only eats grass. So I'm coming back here and looking here and I'm, you know what? I know a grasshopper lives on grass and it does. It sits there and chews up the leaves and eats that food. So I'm gonna add a grasshopper just cause I know they do eat grass. So grasshopper is my herbivore. I'll make that one green and I'll put that here next to this arrow. Okay. And then what would eat a grasshopper? Well, lots of different things would eat a grasshopper but uh, I'm going to look for something on our list maybe that eats this grasshopper. And I think uh, I'm going to look for, mm -hmm, you know what, um, an omnivore or a carnivore. Maybe something like, I don't know, a chickadee. 
So uh, birds definitely eat um, a lot of insects. And I think if a chickadee saw a grasshopper, it would happily um, go ahead and grab it and use it for a meal. So let's do a chickadee. And if you don't know what a chickadee is, they're black cat black capped chickadees is actually the name for them. They're just a really small bird. They're here in Minnesota and they're here most of the time. And then we got to think about, okay, what might eat a chickadee? And not a whole lot of things, but definitely um, some individuals will, I don't like that way that arrow is looking. Um, definitely some individuals will eat it. And you're mainly probably going to look at things like um, maybe some sort of falcon or hawk that eats birds. Even that would have a hard time with a chickadee because they are just so maneuverable and so small. Um, doesn't mean it can't happen though. So I'm going to go to our carnivores and grab something like that. Now bald, bald eagles generally eat fish. That's their big thing. But, um, I think we do have a peregrine. We do have a falcon here. There are lots of birds of prey, but let's use a falcon and we'll add that to our food chain. Okay. So here we go, falcon, great. And that is our last one in the chain because there's not really anything that eats a falcon. The only thing that would really eat any of these things, including the falcon, are some sort of decomposer, some sort of thing that eats dead material, which we did put on our list here. I had you guys put fungus, bacteria, or fungus and snails and earthworms and ants, all that sort of stuff. I'm gonna add one that's kind of very important and that's bacteria. They are very important in decomposing things as well. So we'll add that to our list. There are lots of other things that I, that I know are in Minnesota that did not make it on this list. So if you have stuff that's not on here and you just want to add it, um, feel free. I'll kind of double check things and make sure it looks good. But um, definitely there's lots more that we can have on our list of things here. Okay. Um, so got bacteria on there. Here's what I'm going to do. I am then going to say that, you know what, we have some sort of decomposer that gets its energy from all of these things. And I'm just gonna use fungi. Um, so these, this would be things like mushrooms and things like that. They exist in the soil, they exist growing on trees, etc. Now here's the thing, does a fungus get its energy from the falcon? Absolutely. If a falcon dies, fungus might break it down. What if a chickadee just dies? Yep, a fungus might do that too. What if a grasshopper dies? Yep, fungus will probably destroy that as well. And if grass dies, this is a big one that breaks down that moldy fungusy stuff. Remember, a sun doesn't die, so we'll leave it at that. This right here is what we call an energy food chain, okay? Most of the energy comes in from the sun. Um, it's given to a producer, it's eaten by an herbivore, which is eaten by some sort of carnivore or omnivore. And all those things, when they die, they're decomposed, they're recycled, okay? This stuff is in your notes, down on slide number 19 here, food chains. And we notice that most, all the energy comes in from the sun, it's given to a producer, herbivore. In this case, our omnivore or carnivore is the frog, and that's eaten by a kingfisher type of predatory bird that lives around lakes and bodies of water. Um, what I do want to point out is anytime you make a food chain, two things. The arrow points the way the energy travels, okay? The plant does not give energy to the sun, so the arrow points the other way, from the sun to the plant. The plant has energy in it now, and it gives its energy to the grasshopper. This is the biggest mistake on our project that we're going to do here in a little while that seventh graders make, is they draw the arrows in the wrong direction. They think, oh... Grasshopper eats the plant. I'll draw the arrow that way. The arrows do not represent that. They represent the flow of energy. The energy starts in the plant and it goes to the grasshopper. The grasshopper now has some energy and it goes to the frog. Okay. The second thing that's super important is the size of the arrow. So the energy coming from the sun is huge. It's enormous. There is so much energy available to our plants. The arrow then is big, okay? Now the plants use that energy for cellular processes. They grow things that cannot be eaten, etc. So the plant has less energy available to it um, to give to the grasshopper. 
So the grasshopper is never going to eat all the energy that's locked up in plants. It just doesn't. So a smaller energy or arrow is used. Now, the grasshopper uses energy to grow. It uses energy to move around. It produces some sort of heat when it, when it burns sugar. All that stuff is lost in the environment, and therefore there's less energy available to a frog. And so the arrow is going to get smaller. The frog uses energy to grow and move around and maintain body heat and lose body heat in cellular processes, etc. So there's less energy available to the kingfisher at the end. So the arrows get progressively smaller the further you move down the food chain. And this has to do with the energy pyramid. Probably one of the biggest points of this ecology lesson is about this energy pyramid. If you can imagine, it's kind of like a food pyramid, but we have a huge amount of energy coming in from the sun and the amount of energy goes to the producers. So therefore there is a lot of producers. And if you look outside, most every living thing that you see is probably going to be green. And that's because there's so much energy available to them. And then if you started looking around at the animals that you would find, the most common animals you're going to see are things that are probably right here in this first level, primary level. These are the first consumers. These are the first things that eat. These are the herbivores generally or omnivores. So if you walked outside, you'd probably see way more bees than you would see hawks. You would probably see way more bunnies than you would see foxes, okay? Um, so this group has a huge amount of a living material in it as well. Now again, they use up a lot of energy to move and produce body heat and stuff like that. So there's less energy available to this group. These are the secondary consumers. These things eat these things. Um, not that a spider is eating a deer, but anytime you go up a level, you know, the frog might eat a caterpillar, or the frog might eat this little water skimmer, the frog might eat the bumblebee, right? Um, you know, the dragonfly would eat the water skimmer, the dragonfly would eat the bee, same thing with the um, spider. But these things are consumers that eat other animals, generally speaking. Um, and then there's less energy available to them, so there's less of them. So you're always going to find less frogs than you are, say, grasshoppers. Then we could go to a fourth level, and that gets smaller. And then you could go to a fifth level, and that gets smaller. And then you could go to a sixth level, a seventh level. It depends on how many links you have in your food chain. Um, but every time you go up an energy level, there's less and less energy available to that level. And therefore, there's less individuals in it. So again, you're always going to see less hawks than you are deer, if you were to really go out and survey. There's just less of them. Okay, you're always going to find less snakes than you are, say, caterpillars and grasshoppers, and butterflies, etc. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of how food chains work and also this energy pyramid. Um, what I would like you to do is, and you can add um, one of, you can add a frame if you want, um, but use our list to go ahead and make yourself a food chain. Uh, and you still have lacks access to this from yesterday's post. So if you want to get in there, I'd like to see some of your food chains. Um, you don't have to put your name on it or anything, but um, get some practice. If you don't know what to do, look at some of the other ones that came before. I'm going to go ahead and leave this one up there. I did try and make my arrows get a little bit smaller as we went down. Obviously, these are long here, but it's hard to do the arrows um, at different sizes with this particular program. Anyway, that's food chains and food webs. I hope you have a good weekend. Uh, next week, I'd like to do a little bit of a project when we talk about food webs.